Hello, oh, dear brothers, and today we're going to be talking about does Hegel argue we can think without presuppositions and axioms or that it is impossible? Is the answer somehow yes and no? Question mark. This is going to be considering together the logic dialogue number four on Cadell Last's page, which was just magnificent. It was wonderful to hear all the students talking from the Phenomenology of Spirit course. I was just really, really loved that conversation. And we're also going to be thinking about this in terms of a philosophy of glimpses, which was written between myself, Michelle, Mr. Jock, and Mr. Rivera. Um, <clears throat> there's this really big question, and in my work I'll talk about this all the time, about how the true isn't the rational, which is a notion that the true and the rational are different categories, and that what is rational is relative to what we believe is true. If we think it's going to rain today, it's rational to bring an umbrella even if it doesn't. So the rational is organized by the true. This poses a weird question, though. If rationality comes after what we believe is true, how do we determine what is true? By what mechanism of knowing? Um, it's, it's very strange. And similarly, if we require axioms to think, if we require presuppositions and assumptions and categories, um, how do we arrive at those categories and presuppositions? Because we have to assume them in order to think, of which then means if we think ourselves to presuppositions, the, thinking, the presuppositions we think to will be highly, highly organized by the starting assumption. So you have this profound circular problem. This problem is explored brilliantly in the work of Samuel Barnes, highly suggests his work, The Iconoclast. It also brings to mind the work of David Hume, which I adore, and some of, some of the parts that come up in the conflict of mind. But it's a very profound question. It's very, very difficult to start to approach it. And arguably, the science of logic is in the business of a new logic. And it would seem as if part of discovering a new logic is somehow figuring out how to, th to think without presuppositions or to at least think and formulate logic aware of the quandary that we can't think without presuppositions and, there must, and therefore must choose or could choose presuppositions um, without necessarily justification for doing that. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means we're not limited in our becoming, but that may also mean that our becoming is arbitrary or strange or there's something alien always lurking in the very formation of epistemological schemas. Uh, so what's going on? The other possibility is that we may be able to glimpse or catch glimmers of moments of thinking or thought that is not presuppositional, that doesn't have axioms, only a second later for that thought to vanish and to go away. So there's a bunch of possibilities, and I think all of those are at work uh, in the science of logic, notably, which is what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, and this problem reminds me of the problem between thinking and perceiving, which is in Reconstructing ASA, which is the notion that when I perceive this bookcase without any thinking, I can only perceive it in the moments I talk a bookcase, thinking races in and consumes that raw perception as if the raw perception was always just thinking. But really, it's a distinct form of, um, exper of, of experience, of encounter. Not everything the brain does is thinking. And yet the moment you think about what the brain does, you're doing so in terms of thinking, therefore making it seem like the brain, um, the brain only thinks. Now, what's very interesting in this term has come up in the net, and it's come up with my conversations with Guy Sinstock, who I adore. It seems as if there's also a, a term we could use that's intersuppositional, not just presuppositional. And the intersuppositional is the suppositions that arise between me and otherness, a subject and otherness. And that otherness can be the world, it can be other people, it can be things like that. Uh, with Guy, I've particularly spoken about the intersupposition, that the kind of space, the intersuppositional space that seems to arise when there's a circling, when there's a dialogos. My partiality is for the hip hop cipher. Uh, when you have the spaces where something seems to emerge that cannot be reduced to the parts, that cannot be reduced to the people that spoke, and that helps the people there think things they would have never thought on their own. So there's some sort of like event that occurs in this intersuppositional space that is irreducible. And, um, and, and, and then it happens. And so likewise, like you could say that Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is often a development of a subject according to intersuppositional spaces, themselves encountering world, themselves encountering other subjects, themselves encountering their own need to reason or a world that is other and not bound to their idealism. Um, and that these, and then they, that intersuppositional space is according to which spirit develops, uh, that uh, the subject develops, and in, in, in the phenomenology, it's uh, it's uh, failure, it's failures, inter failures that occur intersuppositionally that transform things.
Well, what's very interesting is that kind of failure in the phenomenology. The failure itself is not really presuppositional. It's a kind of upsetting of the presuppositional, the previous stage of the phenomenological journey, the previous axioms that are unveiled to be incomplete. And it's the movement into intersuppositional space that leads to that sort of change. Likewise, if you walk into an intersuppositional space uh, and you have a hip hop cipher and then suddenly it's possible to think things you never thought before because of that, well, the world becomes a place where you can do that. And precisely if these new ideas emerge you never thought before, in that, at least in that second of origin, there's a lack of assumption. There's a lack of axioms. They're not a product of axioms and presumptions. Now, you may think about it and immediately absorb them into a presuppositional subject, but there is a moment in which they seem to be more intersuppositional uh, than less. And it's almost like in presuppositional thought, you're searching for a ground, like a ground to philosophy, where in intersuppositional thought, you're looking for what can occur in the space between, what can emerge, what, what can happen. That is... Uh, Unexpected, and, I, and there's a way to look at Hegel as gazing into the intersuppositional space, I and world, I and other eyes, and to and kind of ask what happens if we think that, and like you know the intersuppositional space would where would be where becoming other occurs, where the where the subject and become other and move into otherness, and that very otherness you, is not a product of a projection of presuppositions, uh, is a product of the becoming and movement itself. So there's something intersuppositional in operation. Now, the moment you think about it and you ask what's going on, you translate into thought and therefore translate it into assumptions, presuppositions and the like. Um, but there's this glimpse, this glimmer, this flip moment that seems really, really important to catch. And if you catch it, well, and you pay attention to it, uh, and the pre, th th this really matters. And the other thing to say is that, if, indeed, if an individual arrives at new assumptions and presuppositions from an intersuppositional space, these are not going to be the same as, say, the presuppositions that one assumes because of the philosophy they're born into or the religion they're born into. Um, th there's a difference between kind of the presuppositions that are just assumed from a ground and the presuppositions that are the translation of an intersuppositional or emergent occurrence. They seem different in character, and I think that difference is really, really important. Where in the science of logic, you could say there's a, a movement. It would seem to me that there's a movement from just, you know, the presuppositional thinking we're all born into, into intersuppositional experiences, from which when we then absorb um, new presuppositions that are intersuppositionally informed and that's different in character and that and then you have to do it again and do it again and do the process over and over again because even presuppositions that are intersuppositionally informed can fall into becoming more like pure uh presuppositions with time and with a lack of thought and so on and so on and so on so there are these these very interesting glimmers glimpses that are very important um these glimmers to unveil and indeed if in the intersuppositional space there's um, some experience, some sort of encounter of something that is not reducible to presuppositions. Well, if ultimately what Samuel Barnes calls the meta question is the possibility of philosophy without presuppositions, well, then it might be possible to actually have philosophy that's closer to the meta question than not, or maybe even can get true knowledge about the meta question. So, like, for example, if there's an emergence where physics emerges into chemistry, chemistry emerges into biology and so on. Well, <clears throat> if physics could emerge into chemistry, then the, the universe must be a place where such an emergence can occur. Um, now, what are the consequences of chemistry? What does chemistry mean? All that other stuff? Well, that's an entirely different ballgame. But the very emergence means the universe is a place where that is possible. And therefore, when we get to the questions of what is the absolute, what is the constitution of the absolute world well, has to have in it somehow the possibility of emergence in the way that we just described, right? In the same way, it has to have the possibility of emerging to subjects of whom can be bound or stuck in presuppositional thought. So this is, this is real knowledge. This is real knowledge. This is knowledge of which we're, it's not merely truth structures. You know, this came up from Jason in the, the Cadell talk. Logic 4 is the, this kind of idea that after Kant, up to like the neo-pragmatism of Richard Wardery and all that, kind of this idea that we can't get capital T truth anymore, we can only get truth structures, you know, where, where capital T truth is gone forever or whatever. Well, what we're seeing here is reason to believe that's not the case, that we actually can have thought um, that there is reason to believe has something to do with capital T truth. Now, 
you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not the total of capital T truth, maybe it's not all of it, and maybe it's even mistaken. But the very fact that it is philosophy based on the intersuppositional means that it's different in character from the philosophy that's primarily based on the presuppositional. Indeed, getting to capital T truth from the presuppositional seems um, very difficult, and it doesn't really seem to have a good heuristic to tell what presuppositional thought is more likely to be uh, like or reflect the capital T truth than other presuppositional thought. But here we have a tool by which to give ourselves reason to think um, that certain presuppositions are more like the absolute and real, you know, real positive knowledge about the absolute than others. And that would be presuppositions that are formed, that are informed by the intersuppositional. So I think that's important because what we really want to do, my main goal ultimately is um, to suggest the meta question is not unknowable but unknown, which is to say it is, or you know, the absolute, whatever you want to say, which is to say that no, we can never know the whole absolute. But that's different from saying it's unknowable. You know, there is reason to think that we can have philosophy that has something to do with the meta question, even if the meta question must ultimately be unanswerable in its entirety. Uh, but for me, the difference between like nihilism, giving up philosophy, sort of a kind of uh, epistemic hopelessness, is the difference between unknown and unknowability. Now, Mr. Barnes also makes a point quite clear in his book where he says just because your thought is based on assumptions does not mean it is necessarily false. And he also says we can't assume that we can't know the meta question because that in of itself would have to assume the meta question to say. Um, so indeed, that, that's all at play. And the point I'm simply making here is that, you know, presuppositions informed by intersuppositions give us, um, give us unique reason to think that the presuppositions have something to do with the meta question than not. And that's, and I think it has a lot to do with how we can avoid hard nihilism. The, the paper will say a few more things like on a spirit of trust by Robert Brandom. We'll talk a bit about uh, Mr. Holgate, who's a genius. And, you know, Dr. Holgate will talk about how philosophy, you know, and Cadell mentioned this, how, um, uh, Hegel's more interested in enabling condi conditions of philosophy than the pre presuppositions or escaping presuppositions of philosophy, which is quite nice. I like that language of enabling conditions. Um, in, the, in the fourth section of the paper, is going to talk a lot about basic questions of philosophy by Martin Heidegger, um, which Guy Sinstock has been doing a series on, which is magnificent. Again, I love that guy. And, you know, Martin Heidegger makes a point where, you know, cats mice, you know, bookcases, phenomenon like that, hold themselves in their that nest from which we can, for us to derive basic questions about them. It's not like they vanish or anything like that. Um, a cup is just there, and then from its, in its being there, we can de derive questions about it. But philosophy, like, is there relative to our mood or subjectivity or conditioning. And, and so how we are can affect how philosophy is there or if it's there at all, which means the phenomenon, we influence the phenomenon that's there um, from which we then derive basic questions about it. So if we're trying to get basic questions about philosophy, it really matters the way philosophy is there for us, which is relative to who we are and what we do. Well, this is quite weird. That means we have to have a certain mode for it. And for Heidegger, it has a lot to do with wonder, the ability to be struck by being, to be in all of being, the fact that there's being versus not. And it is in that mode of wonder that then philosophy manifests as there in a manner that gives us unique reason to think that the basic questions we derive from that thereness actually have something to do with philosophy. Well, in a similar way, presuppositions are thought that are derived from an intersuppositional space which, again, for there to be an intersuppositional space, we have to condition ourselves rightly so that it's there. Well, the presuppositions so derived from that space are ones that are uniquely likely to provide us with meaningful knowledge or thought or experience about the meta question, about the absolute, about um, the reality that is um, not presuppositional, that is not based or only known through assumption or needs assumption. So there's a, there's a Heideggerian mood, and it's interesting too, like for Heidegger, like, um, this is why clearing and letting be is a big deal. Like, we have to create a clearing so that the philosophy, so that the wonder that appears, there's all the more reason to think that wonder is not just a ex subjective expression as of us, but that it's actually there in the world, that it's actually philosophy, per se, on its own terms, thus increasing the probability that the questions we ask about it are correct.
So similarly, it, it comes with like, we, we have to create the intercept. The thing, the, um, the thought has to arise in the intersuppositional space that is most likely to be like the absolute precise because we've made a kind of clearing for that thought to arise and to emerge in a manner that's not reducible to us. And then that is what we make foundational. That glimmer and that glimpse is what we make foundational for our philosophy. And if we do that, there's a high probability that the character of our philosophy is different from a philosophy that is based on presuppositions and does not know it. Now, at the end of the day, you know, there's these questions um, on to what degree Hegel thinks we can entirely escape axioms, uh, presuppositions, how, how much he thinks uh, we have to kind of tragically relate to them, different things like that. And, and, you know, that's all part of the great debate, but I think it's just very important to see this unique kind of angle, I think, that Hegel's coming at by which to approach this problem of thinking philosophy without presuppositions. And I think it has a lot to do with the intersuppositional. I think also Hegel makes a move where he suggests the practical is more real than the technical. And indeed, the practical, what we practice because of the intersuppositional uh, can be more real than what we practice when we're just dealing with pure autonomous rationality, pure presuppositions. Uh, and and that, that therefore can change the way that the world views reality and what constitutes reality and what is real. For more by OG Rose, please visit ogrose.com, Twitter, Facebook, Anchor, Instagram, so on. And thank you so much for your time.